Welcome to our talk on the stateless permutation of application memory, aka spam. First, a bit about us. Mohammed and I are both PhD candidates at Columbia University working with Professor Simha Sethumalavan. One of the core themes in our research thus far has been memory safety. And more to the point, how the lack of memory safety is a serious problem. People can be discriminated against, spied on, and targeted due to memory safety vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, this problem remains as current today as it has ever been. The reality is that memory safety vulnerabilities are very easy for developers to introduce unwittingly. So just what is memory safety? Well, put simply, it's when you access memory in an unintended way. Think back to any time you've mistakenly overflowed a buffer or forgot to free memory. Now to put into context just how common these vulnerabilities are, consider that 70% of all CVEs in Microsoft products each year are memory safety related. Google as well doesn't seem to fare much better, with around 70% of bugs in Chrome being memory safety related. This just goes to show that memory safety is a widespread problem. But what makes the issue of memory safety so prominent is that attackers love memory safety vulnerabilities. Data about CVEs exploited in Microsoft products show that the overwhelming majority are memory safety related. So what can we do about this? Well, a number of a la carte solutions have been proposed over the years, solving subsets of the memory safety problem. Unfortunately, trying to cover all problems comes with its own set of additive costs. Moreover, the need to take into account hardware side channels, such as speculative execution, have made the goal of achieving memory safety even more elusive. Which brings us to our work, SPAM. SPAM is a unified solution that aims to provide protection against software and hardware-based memory vulnerabilities. Let's dive into the details and see how it works. Okay, now let's see how SPAM works. We start with the struct definition and see snippet shown on the left. In case of using a regular malloc call, this is how the struct instance A1 will be laid out in memory. We use a packed format here for simplicity. The different fields represented by four colors in this case will have the same order as they appear in the source code. That gives an opportunity for the attacker to override the function pointer using an overflow in the buffer C, just because they are adjacent in memory. On the other hand, with the spam in place, the allocation data will be permuted, forcing the attacker to guess which order to use to override the function pointer. Spam also guarantees that each allocation will have its own permutation. For example, here, even though the two allocations A1 and A2 are of the same type, A of T, their layout is different. Furthermore, we can do this without any metadata. This is very useful from a performance and security standpoint, as we will show later. So the question now is, how can spam achieve this? Well, let's start with what happens during object allocation. On the left, we have the struct and its corresponding memory layout. Our goal is to get to the figure on the right, where the struct contents are permuted. To do so, we first request the needed memory from the allocator and get the address. Then we use the allocation address and size as a key to generate a random permutation. Since we are using the address as part of the key, there is no additional metadata. Finally, we will use this permutation every time we access this particular allocation. Now we have fully permuted object as shown on the right. Our current configuration parameters allow us to achieve up to 16 per factorial permutations per each allocation. We can even extend this to 64 factorial if needed. So what will happen when the object is deallocated? Okay, let's talk about object deallocation and reuse, a potential source of temporal memory safety vulnerabilities. For performance reasons, Memory that is recently freed is often reused again, meaning the same virtual address will be assigned to a new object. Well, using the same address for the new object means having the same permuted layout, which may leave us vulnerable to use after free attacks. 
to avoid using the same permutation for the new object, we generate a random number called the alias number upon object allocation. Then we use the alias number to tag the most significant bits of the allocation address. In this case, we use OX cafe as an alias number for allocation A3. As every object instance gets its own alias number, each object will have its own permutation. So, in short, the alias number is used to ensure that the same memory region will be permuted differently when it is reused, simply avoiding issues such as use after freeze and without introducing any metadata. The natural question to ask is how do we handle multi dimensional objects? Well, those are the objects that contain arrays or buffers. The fact that multi dimensional objects share the same base allocation address means that they will be using the same permutation. That could allow the attacker to overflow from one internal buffer to another without being detected. To handle this scenario, we separate these multidimensional objects into two distinct objects. This separation allows us to reduce the problem of intra-object memory safety into an inter-object one. We call this transformation buff to pointer as intra-object buffers are now replaced with pointers that point to a new independent allocation. By separating the objects, we can independently permute each one just as we do for any other allocation. Now that we understand the conceptual model behind this BAM, it's time to dive into the implementation details. Our compiler implementation is split into three parts a source-to-source -source transformation pass in Clang, an instrumentation pass in IR, and a runtime library part of compiler RT. We'll start by looking at the source-to-source -source transformation pass, or buff to pointer. It's best explained through an example. On the left, we have the original non-transform code, and on the right, the result after the buff to pointer transformation has been applied. We begin by promoting types. In this example, struct foo. We split the struct to separate out the buffer and wrap it with its own type, foo buff. We then modify the original field in struct foo to point to an object of type foo buff. Changing the type means that any allocation that previously allocated struct foo will now need to be promoted as well. We allocate both struct foo and struct foo buff, upda updating the appropriate pointer. Similarly, usages are also promoted. An additional pointer dereference is used due to the indirection. And finally, we separately free struct foo buff and struct foo as a result of the transformation. Next, we'll focus on the instrumentation pass and runtime library. The instrumentation is best understood with an example. We'll start with this small sneeze snippet. We'll then compile it without spam and take a look at the corresponding IR. Now, even if you're unfamiliar with IR, it should be pretty easy to see the correspondence of the compilation. You have your malloc, a store, a load, and the call to print f. Now, let's compile this with spam and see what the IR looks like. Highlighted in red are the key spam runtime functions. First, we implement allocator wrappers, which simply just handle the alias number computation and tags the resulting pointer returned from the underlying allocator. In other words, it doesn't add any significant overhead. Second is a permutation primitive spam get perm offset. It takes a pointer and a base pointer, that is the pointer returned from the allocation, and then calculates the resulting address with the permutation applied. Spam get perm offset is the primary source of our overheads. Now, while the previous example showed heap memory being instrumented, we also support stack and global memory. The instrumentation for loads and stores with spam get perm offset remains exactly the same. However, there are two additional components that we need. For globals, specifically those in the .data section, we emit a register global call into the global constructor list to permute memory on program load. Those in the .bss section, which are zero allocated, will be permuted normally when written to. For stack, similar to globals, we have a register stack call that is emitted into the beginning of main to permute variables passed by the OS, namely argv. Now, let's discuss the benefits that the spam offers. Spam provides spatial memory safety as every object instance is permuted independently. 
Moreover, the multidimensional object transformation provides protection against intra-object overflows. These two features enable SPAM to provide wide granular spatial memory safety protection. Temporal safety is also achieved by the alias number construct, which introduces additional entropy when a memory region or an address is reused. As a result, we do not have to quarantine recently freed memory and prevent the program from reusing them. Memory quarantining can significantly increase memory footprint, especially for programs that allocate many objects with short life cycles. A major benefit of SPAM over other memory safety techniques is that it provides sided channel and fault resiliency. All memory is permuted across the memory hierarchy, making leakage through the caches, raw hammer, or cold boot attacks much more difficult. Thus, SPAM provides a unified defense against software and hardware-based vulnerabilities. Finally, the SPAM approach is stateless. It does not require any metadata. Thus, it makes the job of securing the implementation much simpler than other techniques that have a large trusted computing base. Moreover, being stateless allows the SPAM to support multi-threaded applications out of the box. Now to put the security benefits in more concrete terms, let's look at a handful of common exploits and how SPAM mitigates it. Here we have a classic buffer overflow. We have two buffers, side by side, A and B. And we want to override B from a pointer in A. Under normal conditions, the write would happen linearly and thus reliably corrupt B. With spam in place, the write actually becomes nonlinear, as the write to B would be done using the permutation for A. This nonlinear write can land anywhere, which can trigger an exception, for example. Another very common way to do exploitation involves leveraging use after freeze. Much like in the buffer overflow case, any pointer that points to this memory region would be using an incorrect permutation. Remember, the alias number provides multiple permutations in this case. Finally, let's have a look at speculative execution attacks. So this code snippet here is a minimal example for a specter. Normally, the load from A of I to secret can be reliably accessed with an out of bound index I However, with spam in place, the attacker will end up with an unpredictable value in secret as the permutation will depend on the address of A of I effectively breaking the attack. Now that we've established how spam works, let's discuss a bit about how it deals with real world code. Spam requires a strict separation between application code and data from the permuted domain shown here on the left and external unpermuted domain shown here on the right. Otherwise, the loads and stores at either side of this boundary may inadvertently corrupt memory. Now, in order to remain compatible with uninstrumented code, such as non-spam aware shared libraries, we must have a mechanism to reliably cross this gap. Going back to our C snippet from before, the printf is an example of external uninstrumented code. Thus, its arguments would need to be properly handled. To this end, we provide two primitives to allow for interoperability with both domains. And this allows for only the necessary permuted data to cross the boundary where it is unpermuted so it can be accessed by uninstrumented code. Similarly, in the opposite direction, we provide a permute primitive to shuffle the memory so that it is accessible by spam instrumented code. Additionally, if we have multiple chunks of data that are linked, such as structs that point to other structs, we recursively unpermute and permute them as necessary. Now, because of this boundary, we also need to be aware of application code that may be called from either side via function pointers. A good example of this is qsort, which takes a function pointer to a comparison function. Our solution is to take this comparison function and move it across the boundary by choosing not to instrument it, and thus it can reliably operate on unpermuted memory. There are also a few other benefits to how spam is implemented. Spam can be built to rely on hardware support to boost its performance. A simple hardware-based permutation network can save the hundreds of cycles that are currently wasted in the software-based shuffling algorithm. Additionally, merging spam within the IATSE itself will help in decreasing the code size. By compressing the spam get perm offset into spam loads and stores, we avoid 
introducing unnecessary instruction cache pressure. There are a lot of great talks on memory safety at the conference this year, so we thought we'd briefly discuss how they relate to spam. Our memory tagging, or MTE, is a new ISA extension in which memory and pointers are tagged with colors. It provides spatial memory safety by matching the colors of the pointer and the access memory, and throws an exception in the case of a mismatch. However, due to a limited set of colors, ARM MTE has lower entropy against non-adjacent spatial overflows and use after freeze compared to spam. Additionally, MTE is vulnerable to intra-object and type confusion violations. Check C is an extension to C that adds new pointer and array types that are bounds checked to detect spatial memory safety violations. To the best of our knowledge, Check C has no temporal protection, leaving it vulnerable to use after free attacks. The biggest key difference between these techniques and spam is that none other than spam can offer hardware side channel resiliency. Now let's quickly have a look at some preliminary results to see where the current software prototype stands in terms of performance. So we tested the spam on a diverse set of C benchmarks, including the standard SPIC 2017 benchmark suite, for which our LLVM-based prototype has a 2.1 X slowdown. Moving on to more real-world applications, we evaluate Nginx, one of the most popular web servers, for which we see much better performance with spam on the order of 1.4 X. We also evaluate spam on duct tape, an embedded JavaScript, Engine and Wolf SSL, a popular lightweight cryptographic library. Remember, for all of these benchmarks, we verified the correctness of our spam framework by comparing against the reference output. Finally, let's have a look on some unsupported functionality in our current prototype and how we plan to address them in the future. So, spam is still not able to properly instrument inline assembly code. However, in the future, we anticipate that we can support inline assembly with the integration of a lifter. Variadic functions are fully supported in our current prototype, with the only exception being the invocation of external functions that use VA list as an argument. Well, you can think of the VS printf function as an example. So basically passing VA list to external functions is not currently supported by our prototype. However, using VA list inside the instrumented code is fully supported. Well, this brings us to the end of our talk. Hopefully we have shown you how SPAM provides a unified solution to multiple software and hardware memory security issues, how it's able to work without metadata by relying on the allocation address, and how this in turn allows us to support multi-threaded code out of the box. We have also shown you how spam achieves compatibility with non-spam code, potentially easing future adoption, and how there is a path forward to reducing overheads through hardware acceleration. Lastly, we want to share some news with regards to future work. C++ and hardware support are currently in development. So if you are interested in working with us, please reach out. For other details that we didn't have time to cover during the talk, we encourage you to check out the full technical report on Archive. Thank you all.